So the Prem Gardner doesn't need any introduction, but I would just uh, do the formality. So he, Dr. Gardner is a board certified pathologist who specializes in darn pad and bone and soft tissue. He is assistant professor of pathology at UAMS in Little Rock, Arkansas. He is also the program director there for the darn pad fellowship program and also the clinical co-director of the musculoskeletal skin block for UAMS College of Medicine. And despite his, uh, besides his clinical duties, he is also engaged in clinical research and national and international lecturing on topics of bone and soft tissue tumors. He is also actively involved in social media, so that's why he is here today to talk about and speaks to healthcare professionals locally and nationally on how to use different platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram professionally. So he currently serves as chair of the newly created social media subcommittee for both ASCAP and ASDP, that is American Society of Darmpath. He is also a deputy chief editor for Archives of Pathology and Lab Medicine. Congratulations on that new job. Where, among other things, he oversees social media strategy and account management for the journal. So Dr. Gardner obtained his MD from Tulane University in New Orleans, and he did his residency in APCK at Houston Methodist, and then he went on to complete his fellowship in bone and soft tissue pathology under Dr. Sharon Weiss at Darmpad at Emory University in Atlanta. So we welcome you, Dr. Gardner, so please go ahead. All right, thanks uh, for that kind introduction. Um, all right, so let's talk about social media. Some of you have heard at least portions of this talk if you attended my lecture at USCAP um, a couple months ago. But I think I'm gonna add a few uh, different things, so hopefully you'll get you'll take away some some new learning points here. And um, uh, I think if you guys uh, have Periscope, um, uh, if you're following along on Periscope, you can leave comments, and I'll try to to check those towards the end if we have time. Um, I will have to leave actually right at uh, nine o'clock Eastern because I have to go do a sarcoma tumor board presentation. But um, but if we have time, uh, we can answer some questions, or you can just tweet at me, right? And that's the benefit of social media. Um, and I'll answer them in the middle of the night when I'm feeding a bottle to my baby or something. All right, so what I wanna talk about today is um, not just the general basics of social media, because I know a lot of you are probably already savvy, but um, particularly how you can use social media to jumpstart your career in pathology. So I think that there's a lot of real real great benefits to, uh, to doing that. We'll talk about those. So I usually like to start the talk by showing this picture and I ask people, you know, how many of you have seen this picture? And most people raise their hand. And then I ask how many of them are on Twitter and usually only a few people raise their hand. And the reason that this is relevant is that this, this picture from the Oscars last year that um, Ellen tweeted this actually, and it received over 3 million retweets in like a couple days. See, I think it's at three, I think currently it's at around 3.3 million retweets it's kind of maxed out, but it's by far the most retweeted picture on all of Twitter. And now I would like one day to see a pathology picture get retweeted three million times, but we may be waiting a while for that to happen. But I think that this really uh, so nicely highlights how incredibly powerful social media like Twitter and Facebook, how, how powerful they are in reaching a lot of people very, very quickly with new ideas or content, that, that content might be pictures from the Oscars or it might be a new article about synovial sarcoma. Um, it doesn't matter. But the, 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 way that those, uh, the way that those platforms are set up allows them to share content and information very quickly uh, with a lot of people. So what I like to do is during this lecture, if you don't use Twitter yet, and if, you, if there are any of you that, that um, uh, Rufat and Amelia have not badgered into using Twitter yet, you should go ahead and take out your phone now and install Twitter and create an account during this lecture. So I'm giving you permission to play on your phone during lecture. I mean, who does that, right? I mean, that's that's the way I get my med students to give me good feedback as I tell them they can play on their phone during lecture. And then once you start doing a lot of social media, even like, you know, when you're in meetings and stuff, my department chairs, like how Jared's just, you know, doing market research or doing something important. I mean, I could be playing a game and she wouldn't know, although honestly, you could go back and see that I've been tweeting the whole time. But, um, so it's nice, it gives you the, uh, you know, once you start doing this, people people start to ignore that you play around on your phone all the time, and then you can get away with it. So anyway, you can go ahead and set it up. Um, are you, can you guys tell me, are you able to see the right, the bottom right corner of my screen with my username, or does the, or does the video picture of yourself and me show up? Yeah, we can see that. 
Okay, good. So I, I, I see a little video box of me there. I couldn't tell whether that would show up for you guys or not. So, um, okay. so the, the um, reason I'm asking is that down here on the bottom left, you can see that there's uh, my email address. And there's also this link right here, and this will be there throughout the, the lecture. So, you know, don't worry about writing it down quickly. This is a link to my social media for pathologist guide on my website, the Pathology Resident Wiki. It kind of covers, and it's not just for pathologists, any medical professional, it basically is applicable to. It covers HIPAA and privacy and how to stay out of trouble and how to get set up with Twitter and who to follow and what does hashtag and retweet and, you know, at username and all those things mean. So it goes over a lot of the basic questions that people ask. So I, I kind of put that together based on frequently asked questions. And then, of course, you can also tweet at me down here in the bottom corner. That's my username, both on Twitter and I'm also on Instagram. And I have a Facebook page, too. So you can use whatever flavor of social media you love best. All right. So go ahead and take out your phone. I'm not kidding. You really can do it right now during lecture and install Twitter. If you've been if you've been holding back, now's the time. Just dive in. And uh, that's what the app looks like when you look it up in the App Store. It's free. All right. So what is social media? Um, most of you already know, but I think honestly we talk about it a lot. We all understand kind of what it is, but oftentimes if you ask someone to define it, they have a hard time. They have a hard time doing so. And I think that the easiest way to explain social media is that there are websites that allow users, individuals like you and me, to exchange content and to interact with each other about that content. Content can be a link to a new. It can be a link to a new news article. It can be pictures of cute cats or dogs or pandas or whatever thing, pictures of people's weddings or their babies. It can be any kind of information that you want. That's what that content is. That it's shared by, by the users and then other users can share it, respond. Other users can share it, respond to it, like it, things like that. So it's the interactive nature that makes social media social. All right, so these are websites that let users exchange content, and content can also be things that are like this, you know, pictures of pathology. Or like this, you know, pictures of pathology, right? This is content also. Um, this beautiful diffuse neurofibroma with uh, Wagner-Meissner bodies, just gorgeous. One of my, one of the best ones I've ever seen. This cool little melanocyte that uh, had this little like sun floating around. floating around it and then this and a tick you know it could be whatever and then also there are you know you can even get a little bit more creative i did not make this picture i wish i was that creative this is a beautiful piece of work by iheart histo if you don't follow that so if you don't follow that guy you should go do it right now um iheart histo does um basically is kind of the founder of the path art movement um, I started a hashtag for that a year ago, but he's been doing path art for a long time where he'll combine art. For a long time where he'll combine artistic um, works like Van Gogh here with um, an ovary. This is an ovary in the background with oocytes in, in the top there, right? So I, I dubbed this the starry ovary, um, and, uh, and it's a wonderful piece of uh, Photoshop. Uh, Photoshop magic done by iHeartisto. He also has a really cool website and blog, so go check that out. And, um, you know, you can also do kind of funny things. This is one the other day where someone brought up the point that Pacini and corpuscles, which are one of my favorite structures, when you have structures, when you have a favorite histologic structure, you know you're a pathologist, right? And also a nerd, but that's okay. So someone brought up that these are actually called Vader Pacini lamellar bodies if you want to be fancy. So I thought it'd be fun to add Darth Vader on top. So I thought it'd be fun to add Darth Vader on top of those to remember um, Vader Pacini. So I, I felt that that was pretty clever. Um, and then I heard his though, brilliant guy that he is, said, pressure sensitive, don't you mean they feel the force? And I was like, oh.
thought you mean they feel the force? And I was like, oh, that's awesome. So if you laugh at that, you know you're a science nerd. And, um, you know, even pictures of babies sleeping on top of pathology textbooks. You know, the content can be anything that you want. And I find that pictures of babies get a lot more likes than any pathology thing that I ever share. Pictures of babies get a lot more likes than any pathology thing that I ever share. People love this stuff. They like the little babies. That's my youngest daughter, Gabby. All right, so social media basically is just another type of media, right? All right, so social media basically is just another type of media, right? We're used to TV, we're used to the um, you know newspaper in the old days, and and now we're used to regular. you know, newspaper in the old days, and, and now we're used to regular internet and regular websites. But the difference with social media is that you, the user, you're like your own editor. You come up with what content you want to share. User, you're like your own editor. You come up with what content you want to share, and the only thing that's on your social media feed is what you allow to be there, what you put there. Okay, and it's the infrastructure of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram that allow them to have interactions between users that resemble real life. So people often say, well, you're just playing on your phone. You're not. You're actually interacting with another real person. Maybe they're on the other side of the world. They're on their phone, but you're interacting with a real person on the other end. Okay, so it really does. It can be done from a distance. It can be done on everyone's own schedule. You know, I interact with people in India who I would never be able to have a conference call with because it's, you know, the middle of the night there when it's daytime here. And, you know, but on, on social media, I can post. And then when they wake up, they can post some response. And we can have this ongoing conversation in within our normal time frame, right? And you don't have to take block out time from your schedule to go meet with someone or remember to call them. You know, you just check your phone while you're walking, you know, waiting in line for lunch at the cafeteria. And you can have a, a little conversation with someone about whatever. And so I think that those things are great. It, it augments real life relationships, but it doesn't really replace them. I would, as much as I love all of this stuff, I would never just want social media and not have a real face-to-face -face interaction. I love interacting with people face-to-face, -face, but what's wonderful is that in the past, I might see my friends once a year at a pathology meeting. Now I interact with them multiple times per week on Twitter. And it's really cool that you get a chance to, to really build real relationships and friendships over time uh, through social media. And you get a chance to meet new people that you would never have met otherwise. So those are, those are the things that I really love about social media. And it's this interaction between the user. That's the key that makes it social. That's what makes it so powerful. That's what makes it so addictive, right? And the very things that make it addictive, and, you know, we talk about kids that are addicted to Facebook and Twitter, those same things can be used to make it useful for education, for networking, for collaboration, for research, for all of the things we all to do in our careers as pathologists. And that's why... I think it's such a powerful tool. We're taking something that has an, an innate addictive potential and we're putting it to good use in our careers. So I use social media in a wide variety of ways. And those of you who interact with me online already know this. I started out actually using it kind of for networking. I'd meet people at pathology meetings and then friend them. And then I found that it was, you know, the next time I saw them, we had things to talk about because they had traveled to Hawaii. And I said, my sister lives there. We had a conversation about it. And so it's not that you see someone the next year at a meeting and you say, oh, hey, good to see you again. Uh, what was your name again? So how's weather in California? Oh, it's nice. It always is nice. That's great. It's it's more than just that kind of superficial conversation. You get to really, you know, get to meet and know people. And um, also I use it a lot for teaching and for learning. A lot of the content that's out there, there's so much information. It's overload, really. Um, but social media kind of allows me to access the information that's most popular and most useful to me quickly and it brings it straight to me. You know, when I check my phone, it's right there. I don't have to remember to go to a website and look it up or to check the new edition of a journal. It just gets tweeted and, and it'll get brought right up in my feed. And so that's beautiful. You can also do a lot of patient advocacy. I volunteer with patient support groups a lot. We'll talk about that in a minute. And you can even use it for real research, both to use it as a tool to conduct research, to to obtain research subjects, for example. You can also do research and publications about using social media professionally because not a lot of people have yet written about or researched that. So I've got a wide variety of papers in the works right now because journals want to publish this stuff because it's new and it's hot and no one's doing it yet. There are very few people who have talked about it. So junior people, this is a great opportunity for you. You want to get your name out there? This is the stuff you can be doing. And finally, 
I use it for communication. People often will contact me via Twitter or Facebook and say, hey, can I send you a consult? What's your address again? My email is not hard to find. It's it's out there. But people are so used to using Facebook Messenger or Twitter that people will often send me messages that way rather than text me or email me. So it's useful to have all these channels available in case someone needs to get in touch with you and realize that they don't have your email address. So all of this together really kind of comes up to one word, branding. And branding is is a word we hear thrown around a lot in business, and we're not really used to using that, I think, medically or career-wise, but we should be. It's a very useful term. So, you know, branding in Texas, branding means this, right? You know, putting a mark on a cow. Um, some people are into weird stuff like branding their own skin, not my cup of tea, but, you know, that's another use of the term branding. But I like what Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon.com, what he says about branding is that your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So your brand is basically your reputation. When you say, Amelia Madrigal, what everyone thinks when they hear your name or see your face, that's your brand to that person. So your brand can be good or it can be bad. And all of the different things that you do, all of the interactions that someone has with you or with things that are generated by you builds or hurts your brand, okay? And think about that, you know, in the media, think about the times that actors and actresses, they do something great and everyone loves them. They make a big mistake. People are like, oh, that's not very cool. And their brand kind of goes up and down depending on what they do. So you all know who this is, right? We don't have to put a name, right? And this is Kim Kardashian. And people often say that Kim is, is famous for doing nothing because she was on a reality show. But I think actually Kim is a very brilliant media savvy, social media savvy marketer. She knows all about brand building and the way that she interacts with, with her followers through social media it has built her an enormous following and huge popularity. Now, what that says about our country or about our culture may be debatable, but I think that pathologists could take a few pages out of Kim's book and learn a little bit about how she brands herself. We might not want to do some of the risque selfies that she's into, but otherwise there are a lot of really, actually, really a lot of useful things that she does that she knows a lot about social media. She has more followers than anyone else on Twitter. So brand building or reputation building, it can be a little uncomfortable for people. You know, some people are more outgoing and comfortable talking about themselves like me, for better or worse, that's how I am. Um, I was born like that. But other people are shy and introverted and don't feel comfortable doing that. But if you're gonna have a career, it's an essential part of career growth, everyone has to do it. You have to get yourself out there, you have to get your name out there. And there's kind of two aspects here, I think. On one hand, you can have self-promotion, right? You can just talk all about yourself and say you're great and wonderful. But someone who just does that and has no substance behind it, people are gonna find out really quickly, and it doesn't matter how much you talk yourself up, if there's nothing there, you know, you won't you won't be interested. Like think about all those Ray-Ban sunglasses you see on Facebook, right? We all know that they're fake. So it doesn't matter how many times it pops up in my feed, I'm going to ignore it or delete it every time, right? Because I know it's just shameless self-promotion with no substance. But on the other side, you can have substance. You can have someone who's an amazing pathologist, has incredible skill, has done research. But if their name's not out there and people don't know who they are, they are going to have fewer opportunities, fewer open doors, and not only for their own career, but also fewer chances to collaborate with other people who might have similar interests. So you could be a brilliant researcher, but if you're you know, not really getting your name out there, there may be other people out there that are really fascinated with what you're doing and want to work with you and write a paper with you, and you can have this incredible synergy, but you never get a chance to meet those people, or they never get a chance to meet you because you haven't you know, gotten your name out there and promoted yourself a little bit. So you've got to kind of find that sweet spot right in the middle where you have both appropriate sharing of information about yourself, appropriate amounts of self-promotion, but substance behind it. If you've got substance, it's real easy to get your name out there because all you have to do is share the stuff that you're doing and people will follow and people will see that you're someone who's worth paying attention to. So everything that you do online, whether it's good or bad, will build your brand or hurt your brand in the eyes of the people who follow you. So think about that, and I think that's a good rule for all of us to live by, even without social media. If you're putting something in writing that you would really be ashamed to have out there, you might want to rethink doing that. Even an email is not safe and secure. Emails can get screenshotted or forwarded to other people where you didn't intend them to go. So, you know, be cautious with what you do online. But if you're, you know, working hard to do good for other people online, pretty soon people will take notice of that and that will help your career. So these are some examples. You know, I wanted to start a teaching website. I'm not a coder. I know a little bit about website coding, not very much at all. I didn't have the time to do it. 
But a couple of years ago, I started thinking, you know, maybe I can use social media to do some of the teaching online that I was interested in doing. So what I did is I created this uh, public web page, excuse me, a public Facebook page, which basically function like, functions like a web page. It's, it's publicly available. So, you know, my personal Facebook account, I may not be comfortable friending everyone. I, I actually friend a lot of people. If they're a pathologist, I'll usually friend them if, if I've interacted with them online a little bit or met them in real life. But this is a page that anyone can follow. And if I post something here, you can take it and share it with your friends who may not be friends with me. And otherwise, they wouldn't be able to see it. But on this page, if I post it, people can share it. They can comment on it and interact with it. So it's just like a website, only it's free. It's really easy to do. and doesn't take any coding knowledge. And it's interactive. People are able to comment, post, share, all the things that make social media powerful. And what's also really cool is if you have a Facebook public page, look at this. You can see how far your posts have gone. So that week, I've had 23,000 people viewed my posts. I got 104 likes of my page. There's all sorts of information that's kind of analytic data about what my followers on Facebook or my friends on Facebook felt about the posts that I made that week. And that's really cool stuff. Just, I mean, the numbers themselves are interesting if you're kind of an analytics nerd like me. But also, those numbers help you to identify the kind of content <clears throat> that people find really valuable and the kind that they're not really interested in. It helps you hone what, if you're interested in teaching, it helps you hone what you teach. And think about that in lectures. We always give people those little, you know, please fill out feedback, please write comments. And very few people do because we're all busy. But this naturally is a way Facebook automatically keeps track of what stuff people like and don't like and gives you that information right away. So even if people don't leave you feedback, you can tell based on how many people are viewing or sharing or liking your posts whether or not they find that content valuable. And I think as a teacher, that's a very valuable valuable information for me to help me kind of select what things I post and share and what I spend my time on. <clears throat> so, you know, here's an example. Like, this is a great way to tell apart melanocytes from keratinocytes. They both get vacuoles. People have trouble telling them apart as junior residents. Look, you get a, a vacuole on the outside and the, the cytoplasm shrinks up and hugs the nucleus. If you see that, that's probably a melanocyte. Keratinocytes have the opposite. They have a naked little nucleus surrounded by a vacuole with the cytoplasm pushed to the outside near the desmosomes. So I shared that, and it was pretty cool because people, like 10,000 people, looked at this post. And this was last year, you know, like last fall. So um, I have a lot more followers now, actually, and I tend to get a lot more people that see my posts. But um, here's another one that I posted just recently, and it wasn't really a pathology thing. It was just kind of a cool little, uh, little card that someone sent for Mother's Day that I found online. And it said, Mom, you gave me something Dad never could. And then it's got this awesome picture of the mitochondria, right? And that's super clever and nerdy and funny. And I posted it. And look at that. Within like three days of Mother's Day, 140,000 people had seen this. It wasn't even mine. I just shared it and shared the link. But 140,000 people saw it. It was shared, um, I can't remember, uh, six... 600 times, I can't remember, somewhere here, oh, 560 times. So you can see how many comments, how many shares, how many people clicked on the post, how many people followed the link. You get all that information. It also shows a couple people didn't like it. 17 people hid the post and said, this is not fun. Or five people said, just you know, block that Jared Gardner guy. You can't please everyone. If this card doesn't please you, then maybe you shouldn't be following my account because this is the most funny, awesome thing ever. I'm just kidding, but it's partially true though. All right, so I, I think it's really cool to be able to see that kind of data. And this is just another view. You can look at each post like this, and it shows you how far it's been shared, how many likes, all of those things. <clears throat> and you can use this for more than just sharing, you know, clever uh, Mother's Day cards and um, pictures of, of pathology cases. You know, this is a real paper that I actually published in the peer review literature with Nicole Riddle, who's also on Twitter. So we published this, The New Kids on the Block. There's a little throwback to the 90s there. If you get that, you can laugh uh, and chuckle internally. Um, and it was about recently characterized soft tissue tumors and new molecular findings in soft tissue. It's published in a good journal <clears throat> um, in surgical pathology clinics, but not a lot of places have access to that journal. And so it may not have been widely read. Otherwise, even though I think we, we wrote a really nice review and a nice pictures, you know, not to not to boast about ourselves, but I was pleased with the outcome of the, the paper. But some of those papers get written and then sit there and get viewed only by the authors and the author's mom, right? or maybe a handful of other people. Well, this is a new way. We took information from this and we shared it through Twitter. So it, you know, directing people back to the article and look what happened. Now somewhere there, we have this table from the thing that, the paper that shows all the new molecular findings that are, you know, kind of in a nice table. Everyone loves tables, right? Because 
I'm a soft tissue pathologist, and I still can't remember all of these translocations. It's probably embarrassing to admit that, but it's so true. There are a bunch of letters and numbers, right? It takes practice to get them into your head, and so these tables are useful ways. So we shared this and tweeted it during CAP 15 meeting last year, and look at that, 7,000 people saw just that one tweet, and you know, 84 people clicked the link to follow through to the paper. This is you know, more views than a lot of journal articles may get in several years in, in within a week of a tweet. So um, it's really a valuable way when you publish new information, share that. Don't just let people find it on PubMed or go read it in that journal, especially it might be an obscure journal. Share it with your followers. Tweet the link to that paper. Share a figure from it or some other similar things and reference your own work. There's nothing wrong with that, right? We're supposed to do that. We want our work to get cited. Why not cite it on Twitter? Why not cite it on Facebook? It doesn't replace the traditional style of publishing and citation, but it certainly amplifies and augments it, I would argue. So let me tell you my story, just so you can see how social media has had an impact on my career and my career development in a relatively short time. I did a residency, I graduated residency in 2010 and then went to Emory University and I did Dern Bath uh, Fellowship there and also bone and soft tissue uh, sarcoma pathology with Sharon Weiss. And when I, when I graduated, I uh, came directly here to Little Rock and started practice at the University of Arkansas in July of 2012. Not quite four years ago. It'll be four years in July. So the next year, 2013, I decided to create two discussion groups on Facebook, one focused on derm path and one focused on bone and soft tissue tumors. This was kind of in lieu of doing a website. And these groups blew up and exploded. Within months, I had thousands and thousands of members. I thought it would just be a, a group of my friends and we would share cool cases um, for education. But we have people from all over the world posting cases multiple times per day now. You know, two and a half years later, we have, I think it's actually 18,000 members in this one of the groups and 20 some thousand in the other group. Um, I recently tallied up how many cases have been posted for a paper I'm writing about Facebook groups. Um, and we found between five and 800 cases um, have been published for, by me and by many other people in those groups um, with really robust discussion, which is awesome. So this was a major turning point in my career when I realized this many people were interested in, in what I had to say and share about pathology online. I felt this is where I should be investing my time and energy. And you know, I tell my residents and I'll tell you guys, Social media has been one of the best decisions career-wise that I've made in the four years I've been in practice. One of the best things that I've done and certainly the most mileage and most efficiency for the time invested, social media. More than any paper I've ever written and my, my co-faculty here get a little upset with me sometimes when I say that. I'm not saying you shouldn't write papers or do traditional academic stuff. I write a lot of papers actually, but using this on top of the traditional academic stuff makes an enormous but enormously greater impact. It really amplifies what you're trying to do, right? This is why I tell all my residents you should be doing this. This is what you should be spending your time on. It's time well spent. So here's the bone and soft tissue group. I think many of you are probably members. And I recently, like last year, I put together a little editorial board. These are all editors on the group and have the ability to, you know, to block people, delete spam, add new members, approve posts. And they kind of help manage the, the group so that it's not so much burden on me. We share the responsibility and they also get kind of the name recognition of being listed there at the top of the group as people who are, are key members. And this was back when we had 17,000 members. Like I said, I think we're over 18,000 now. And look, here's this one example. You know, someone, one of my friends from India posted this case of a uh, tumor with atypia and fat. And there's discussion, is it a typical lipomatous tumor or not? And how do we classify this? And look at how many comments, 84 comments on this thing, 84 back and forth, robust, rich discussion points about this one tumor. Think about this. This is what we want to happen at national meetings, right? We give presentations and we say, oh, there's only time for one question and then we, we're behind schedule. Have you ever not seen that happen, right? Maybe they let two questions happen. And it's not the fault of the meeting presenters, it's just this is the nature of, we wanna to try to pack in as much new data as possible to a meeting. There's not enough time to have discussion. Also, some people are not comfortable standing in front of a room of 500 people and asking a question at a microphone. I'm comfortable speaking in front of as many people as are out there, but not everyone is. 
And, and this is a nice way for people to be able to make comments and have discussions, even if they're very introverted, even if they're uncomfortable speaking in front of people, they're not uncomfortable posting here a response and, and uh, having a question in front of 18,000 people online, because you can take the time to kind of think what you're gonna write out and say. So I think it's actually a really good tool. Some of my friends who are introverted have asked me that, you know, for networking, they said, you know, Jared, you can just go talk to anybody, but I don't feel comfortable doing that. And I've over time found that social media, I think is really helpful to people who feel that way, who have who have less comfort with um, you know kind of uh, a highly attended social situations. So I love that here on Facebook, a tool that most people use for playing around and wasting time, we're having a discussion about atypical lipomatous tumor, where 84 people are commenting. I mean, it's amazing. So in 2014, I created some Twitter accounts. I had create, I got my own Twitter up and running in 2009, but I didn't really use it. Um, for a long time, and I'll get to that in a second. 2014, I created Twitter pages for my department and local societies. So I put our department online, and now I think our department is actually, uh, we're, I guess this is a little out of date, our department, um, pathology has, uh, um, our pathology department is, I think, second most followed pathology department on Twitter after Hopkins. So not too bad for, uh, you know, uh, a university that's old, but in a you know a smaller state that's not one of the big northeastern programs. I think it's not too bad. I'm, I'm still waiting for them to give me a raise because of this, but um, in the meantime, I'll just I'll just take their their love and, and approval. That's all I really wanted. Uh oh, I think I did something. Oh there. Okay. So in 2014, I also made another decision that really has changed the course of my career in a short time. I decided to join a sarcoma patient support group, uh, a group about dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, DFSP. It's a sarcoma that occurs in the skin and that I have a great interest in because I do derm path and sarcomas um, pathology. And so, you know, even someone kind of outgoing and slightly, you know, interested in pushing the envelope like myself, I still worried a little bit, like, is this normal? Is this okay to be in a patient group? What if they ask me, you know, for medical advice? Will I get sued? I had all those kind of doubts that many people feel when they think about joining a group of patients and interacting with them. But it's changed my life and I would I would do it again in a heartbeat. It is, I can never look back from this. It's been perfect. I'm now a member of a dozen different groups because it's been so impactful on me, not just from a career perspective, but just really interpersonally and you know, it's given me so much meaning in the work that I do. All right, so this lady right here, her name is Pip, and she lives in the United Kingdom. And I'm sharing this picture, it's publicly available. She's given a group, I think in 2008 or 2009. So when I, yeah, 2008, when I joined, it had been six years since the group started. There were about, I think, six or 700 people in the group. And um, uh, good, I see a question there about HIPAA. I will get to that in just one second. Um, and so when when uh, when Pip uh, created this group, I, I joined it and I introduced myself as a pathologist. And I said, I can't give medical advice. I'm not any of your doctors, but I'm happy to give you basic information about pathology terms, help you better understand your tumor, and um, and also you know learn from you what it's like to live with this disease. And I got such a huge, overwhelmingly warm response from all of the patients in that group. It was amazing. And Pip said. Jared, you're the first medical professional of any sort that's ever contacted us or asked us what we think about our tumor. And that shocked me that in six years, no one, no one even knew these people were there, that there was a group of 600 DFSP patients. Even the biggest cancer centers in the world would have trouble getting a group of 600 DFSP patients together. But here they all are on Facebook. And uh, it's been a really incredible experience. And I've joined angiosarcoma groups and a lot of other groups. Now I've actually met some of these patients in real life. They've, uh, they, I've, I've been in their city. They've asked to come and meet me and have lunch with me. It's, I've really developed some close friendships with, with many of them because the nice thing is they're not my patients. I don't have a doctor-patient relationship with them. I'm an advocate for their disease and a champion. I want to educate other people about their disease. And I've learned so much from them about their disease. So someone asked a question about HIPAA and and that's always, uh, you know, the way that I think of it, and we don't have time to go really far into it here, but the basic easy way is think of Facebook and Twitter the same way you would think about a medical journal. A medical journal may be professional, but it is not HIPAA compliant. You can't release medical identifiers or patient protected um, health information on in a journal, right? You can't say that on this day we treated this patient. That's an identifier. You can't give names or social security numbers or anything like that. 
But if you think about it, we actually get quite a bit of information when we publish a case report and say this is a rare tumor that's only been described. This is the first example. And this is a 32-year-old female from New York. And if you say all of that, well, then, you know, someone could potentially find out who that patient is. But we're still allowed to do that when we publish a case report. So I actually go above and beyond that. I actually usually alter the details when I post the case. I don't post it the same day that I saw it, usually if it's something rare. I, I oftentimes will change the, the age or the location a little bit to make it a little bit more obscure. That's not required by HIPAA. I do that just to go above and beyond HIPAA because HIPAA is just a rule. It's a law, right? I want to follow that law so I don't get in trouble. What really matters more is patient privacy. That's an ethical principle. To me, that's a much higher level than HIPAA. So if we strive to meet the ethical principle of privacy, we'll automatically be able to comply with HIPAA. So the big thing is just the same way that you would be careful of not releasing identifiers in any other electronic format. Follow the same rules on social media, but go above and beyond. And also you do have to comply with your institution's policies, even if they're draconian or ludite, even if they're not very forward thinking. If your institution says you can't post cases or any information or anything about medicine on Facebook, you got to comply that with that or face the consequences, unfortunately. I don't like that. And if my institution imposed that kind of a rule on me, I would actually quit my job and I would find a different job because social media is that important to my career. So hopefully my chair uh, will support me in that. Um, and uh, there's another question about are there conflicts about ownership when it comes to publishing? That's a complicated question, I guess. Um, I don't know the answer. I think that Putting something on Facebook or Twitter is not the same as publishing it. And so I think it's okay if you've shared a case on Facebook to publish it actually in the peer reviewed literature later. I think that there are two different things as far as a publishing standard goes, but I think the privacy rules are similar between the two. All right, so let's move on so we can try to finish up here in time. Um, so in 2014, two years ago, I presented a practice changers at USCAP. It was packed, it sold out. And I had about 500 followers at that time on Twitter. And now I have, well, I had over 5,000. Now I just recently hit 6,000. The point of that is not how many followers I have, but the point is look at that explosive growth, over a 1,000% increase in growth of people who follow me or interested in what I have to say. For your career, that's a hugely important thing in two years, guys. Way more. I mean, it takes people a decade of publishing to get this kind of increase in people knowing about them. All right? I started a live tweeting group for USCAP last year, and it was very successful. Um, I sent out a tweet and asked people who wanted to tweet about the USCAP meeting. And I got a bunch of people who signed up and USCAP liked the idea, made this nice poster. And you can actually track tweets on uh, this website called Simpler. They'll track healthcare hashtags. And so they tracked tweets about the meeting and there were, look at that, 5.8 million people or views of tweets about USCAP 2015. So when I shared that information with the leadership of USCAP, I got a phone call a couple of days later and they said, we want you to run a social media committee for the entire USCAP organization. So now I'm the chair of social media for USCAP and I run their Twitter and Facebook accounts uh, with a team of, of people who helped me. So we tried to do the same thing again this year and look, look at the results. This year we had 27, it's actually ended up being a little higher than this, over 27 million views of tweets, 18,000 total tweets, 1,200 people participating in Twitter about a pathology meeting. That's incredible, right? This doesn't cost money to do. This is free. This is amazing. So how will 2017 do on USCAP? No idea, but it's going to be pretty amazing, I bet. All right. So and now I, I run social media for both USCAP and the American Society of Dermpath. I've been invited to board meetings and strategic planning meetings. And again, I'm not saying that to boast. I'm saying that at this point in my career, I'm junior enough that I should not be getting these kind of opportunities. And the reason I get them is not because of where I train. It's not because of the papers I've published. It's because I'm the guy who does Twitter and does Facebook for pathology. And you all can be that person too. I'm only one guy. I can only do so much. This field is right for the taking. Get out there and get your name out there and start getting these opportunities. It's easy to do. It takes. It doesn't take that much time. And while you're doing it, you're having fun, you're learning, you're teaching other people. It's wonderful. All right. So the professional benefits we've kind of talked about, your name recognition. I've been invited to lecture multiple times on this topic. Um, next year, I'm actually directing a three and a half hour course on how to become a social media pro at USCAP. So you can sign up for that if you want. And also collaboration and research. I actually have multiple papers in the works right now that are research papers about social media. Here's a collaboration um, uh, that that I did with Casey Gigoto from Japan. He posted this cool case of sparganosis. And I said, hey, we should write this as a case report. So we did. We published it. And here, Gina Johnson, who's going to be my Dermpath fellow next year. So that worked out well for her. She was the first author. Here, and she's in Atlanta. I'm here in, in Little Rock. 
And then these two uh, gentlemen are in Japan. And so uh, from across the world, we wrote this little case report about sparganosis that all started with Facebook. And what was really cool is it accidentally got published on the cover of the Journal of Cutaneous Pathology, not once, but twice through a little glitch in the editing system, I think, January 2015 and March 2015. So I did assure that my promotion and tenure committee that I only listed it once on my CV, but I did say see also the second um, reference there. And I was I was very pleased to be able to include that in my CV. It's one of my one of my proudest achievements. I'm, I'm close to retirement now, I think. All right, so research, let's touch on it briefly before we finish up here in just the last few minutes. What we did last year is I had a medical student, Jasmine Haller. We wanted to do a research project. A lot of patients in these support groups have told me they like having a pathologist in their group. The patients have said that. So anecdotally, it's fine to tell people that, but other pathologists are kind of skeptical. They think, really, do the patients really want you there? So what we did is we surveyed 12 sarcoma or soft tissue tumor support groups on Facebook six of which I was involved with and six of which had basically no pathologist involvement. And what we did is we, we did a survey for a couple of weeks and we got 541 respondents to a survey about sarcoma patients and how they feel about pathologists. That is incredible. Just getting that many respondents in two weeks, the survey cost us $75 to do because we paid for the little upgraded version of SurveyMonkey to get it, um, increased analytics. That's an amazing impact. Even the biggest cancer centers in the world would have trouble getting this many sarcoma patients to respond to a survey about their disease and about pathologists. So we're working on the paper for this, but to our knowledge, this is the largest survey of sarcoma patients and how they feel about pathologists ever conducted, let alone through social media. So just briefly touching on the high points from Dr. Holler's research, what we found that was most interesting is that in both groups, if you ask the patients, are pathologists an important part of the patient care team? Most of the pa patients and uh, family members in both groups said, yes, pathologists are important. And the difference was that groups that had a pathologist involved, 93% of them said yes, and 85% of the other groups. So I didn't think that that was that big of a difference. But when you actually calculate the p-value, it's 0 0.0085. So having a pathologist in the group increases the patient perception of how valuable we are to patient care. And that's exactly what we want to do for our specialty, to help patients see that we're really valuable and important to patient care. We also asked them, did the pathologist post help me understand my disease? Most of them said yes. Uh, a large number of them said it actually helped them feel less anxiety about their disease, being able to have questions. And a lot of these questions were simple things like people will ask me, can I pass on DFSP to my child? I said, well, there's no literature to su suggest that at all. So I feel like there's almost no risk to me as a pathologist to answer that question that's like basic from the literature, but their surgeon may not know the answer to that. He may have only seen one or two DFSP before. This is something I think about and read about all the time. So it took me 10 seconds to answer that question. And that patient who spent every night worrying that their kid was gonna have an increased risk of getting DFSP, that's a great amount of anxiety relief that they were able to get from that. So I'm happy to be able to help. It's kind of my form of medical volunteerism and we're able to actually do research based on it. So here we asked, having a pathologist involved in the group is a good thing and 98% of respondents that had a pathologist involved agreed. You can't get 98% of people to agree about anything. So I was really pleased to see that the, that the patients wanted this, and many of them said that they wanted to have more pathologists involved in the group. So a few other projects I partnered here with Pam Williams, a PhD in nursing. We got a $50,000 grant to do a survey study of DFSP patients, and we're in the process of getting that paper put together now. The patients actually helped us design the survey and conduct the research, and patients will be as authors on the paper with us. So this is truly patient-centered research because the patients actually came up with this idea. They approached me and said, will you please do a research project on us? And so when I told my IRB that, they were like, that's so cool, that's amazing, that's patient-centered research, we'll help you, we can help you get a grant. And I thought, whoa, I thought IRBs were supposed to make my life difficult. And here they were helping me get grant money and, and really put together a study that's very innovative and interesting that patients came up with and participated in as research partners. And we just recently got an IRB approval, one of my residents and I, for doing a large prospective study of DFSP patients, where the biggest, the problem with DFSP is it can recur over a long period. And what we really want is to not see five years of follow-up. I want to see 15 years of follow-up. I want to see how these patients do long-term and find out answers to questions like, which is better, Mohs or wide local excision? Does radiation therapy help or does it not? We can't answer those questions very well right now because the, the studies are relatively limited in sample size. They're not head-to-head -head comparisons and they're not long-term follow-up. And so we can get around all of that with Facebook because I don't have to spend thousands of dollars calling patients who have moved. I just send them a message on Facebook five years from now and say, hey, how are you doing? Have you had a recurrence? And our IRB approved us to do that. It's amazing. 
So we're working on that. It's going to be a large undertaking. But to me, this is changing the way that I'm going to do research from now on. I, I won't do the traditional method very often of, of making phone calls to track down rare cases. For diseases that are known and have a Facebook group, why not just partner with those patients? You get so much more information. Patients will share pictures. They've given me pictures to let me use in lectures. They want to help. They want other people to not suffer the way they have. These people are very, very driven to help others. It's really amazing and very inspiring to remind me of why I do what I do as a pathologist. And it also reminds me that every time I think I have a bad day, I have no idea what it's like to deal with a real problem from, compared to what many of these patients go through. So it very much reframes my perspective about life and about, about my work. So anyway, we kind of covered that, sorry. And I've got other papers, like I said, in the works. So in, in summary and finishing up, I would encourage you to take the, the JM Gardner MD challenge for Twitter, okay? Install Twitter and tweet or retweet just one time per weekday for a month, okay? Most people try it a couple times and they say, this is weird and they give up. When I first started Twitter six or seven years ago, I thought it was weird and I would never get the hang of it. And now I, you know, very active on Twitter. So try it once once a day. And if after a month you don't see the value in it, then you get your money back. And I'm just kidding. There's there's actually no no financial remuneration to you. But um, but since it's free, it's it's a pretty low risk thing. It doesn't take much time. And I think most people who try it are like, wow, this is really cool. And most people then come to me and say, okay, you were right. I, I should have joined Twitter earlier. And then I say, I told you so. And it's very satisfying to me as well. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry that was kind of fast and furious, but hopefully we finished up with only a couple minutes late. And um, I can take maybe one question that I have to run. So just a quick question, which is kind of uh, really very basic. So one thing like about Twitter, uh, uh, from our program at Mount Sinai, uh, St. Luke Roosevelt, we are actually very active on social media, so like we have a departmental Twitter page that we have set up recently. And in fact, you would be happy to know that we are 20 residents and 10 of us are already on Twitter and we are using it very actively. And I applaud you, that's wonderful. I'm very proud of you guys. So yeah, I mean, we, we kind of found out that it's utility in definitely, like as you say that, that the topic for today's talk was that how to jumpstart our career. And definitely, I think it has a role. We need to know the basics of pathology anyway, of course. We need to know the basics as residents. We need to know microscopy, but hey, how to reach out? We are some some point in our career, the juniors need to, like, they are going to apply for a fellowship. So once they see themselves visible, you can make yourself more visible. There are more people who will be seeing you. So when you apply for a fellowship, just giving you an example, so you can reach out that person, you can message that guy, then see that, hey, I am applying. That's an example of how social media can help you and once i mean you are we are a junior pathologist senior resident i mean it only helps as you give your example only so yeah i think it's great i agree with all those points and especially your point about increasing your chance of getting a fellowship you may say well other than jared what what pathology fellowship directors are on twitter but more and more of them are joining largely because i'm trying to badger them into joining but, but I think that more people are joining and also more people are interested in doing social media, but don't necessarily know how. So I think there's a growing kind of market, if you will, for um, people that are savvy and are, are willing to help set up a departmental Twitter account. That might be useful when you go to get a job and a, and a practice says, hey, we want to get on social media. We don't know how. Having the skills and the following and saying, hey, I know how to do that. I run two Twitter accounts already and I have a lot of experience. That's a nice selling point. It doesn't hurt, certainly, to, to be able to do those things and help people with just kind of because people will start to regard you as the techie person in general, even if you're not. But, you know, knowing that stuff, I know I know of a couple of instances where actually a Dernpath Fellowship, part of the influencing decision was the fact that the person was really good. But what helped tip the scales was that also they did a lot of social media and they'd be able to kind of help run the social media accounts. I certainly know that when I look for people to write papers with, have all my committees, or for my own fellowship, I find that oftentimes those people are people that are on social media. It's not that I'm trying to be biased against anyone who doesn't use it. It's just that's the easiest way for me to have contact with people. So I might meet you at a meeting once last year, and if you're not on social media, the next time I see you, I might not even remember your name. But if you're on social media and tweeting and interacting with me daily, six months from now, I might be like, this guy's great. You know, Let's get him plugged in on something or put him on a committee. And I've done that. I've put people on committees that I've never met in real life only on Twitter. Is that crazy? Well, it's worked out for me so far, so I don't know. We'll yeah, find out. 
Thank you very much for your time. I have to run now. Thank you very much for doing this. It was a pleasure and we can uh, we can do it again soon, okay? Sure. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. And thanks all the viewers of Thanks for learning in. Thanks. All right, yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Anybody that's still on Periscope? Yeah. Uh, all additional questions could be posted to at NYC Pathology. And thanks everyone from all over the world who have joined in. So, great, thanks a lot.